So thank you very much for the kind invitation. So my task is to discuss with you about uh, aspergillosis in uh, ICU patients because the title was in non uh, neutropenic, but I will focus my attention mainly on ICU. Uh, so these are my disclosure, even regarding the actual presentation. So let's move to something about invasive aspergillosis because uh, aspergillosis is a, a, a mold that is probably everywhere. We have uh, m more than one Aspergillus, the best, but the most important one is Aspergillus fumigatus. His uh, ubiquity means uh, no geographic predispos predisposition, and this is an opportunistic pathogen. It is the host. So what is important about Aspergillus is the conidia are infectious unit, and they can be inhalate and are usually form of hyphae. And uh, usually we have primary respiratory infection with underinvasion that leads to necrosis of the tissue, and we can have pneumonia or sinusitis, and we can have especially in patients that are not completely immunocompetent dissemination, and obviously dissemination is associated with high mortality, and we can have this dissemination especially in the brain, in the skin, and the GI tract, in the pericardium, and in the myocardium. So we have different forms of aspergillosis, and this is very important when we start discussing about aspergillosis. So we have, obviously, the aspergillus can uh, uh, penetrate through the airways and uh, nasal exposure, and then we can have persistence without disease, and we can classify as a colonization. And we have a lot, and you have a lot of these patients in your ICU, colonized by aspergillus. But then we can have three different types of disease. We can have the invasive aspergillosis, and we can divide them in acute and in subacute. And usually the acute is the, when the course of the disease is less than one month. And then we have one three-month disease when we classify it as subacute or chronic. Then we have the chronic aspergillosis when uh, the course of the disease is more than three months, and we have different type of diseases we have chronic cavitary pulmonary, then we have the classic vaspergilloma, or the chronic uh, the, 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 the fibrosin form or the invasive sinusitis, and then we have the maxillary form, and then we have the allergic form. So three different forms. So obviously in ICU we will focus more on invasive form and even in some form of uh, chronic aspergillosis. What about data in the ICU? Unfortunately, the data in the ICU are scarce because there is the low index of suspicion and because the positive culture are often discharged as colonization or contamination and uh, also because there is an absence of diagnosis reference standards. So we have a lot of standard for neutropeny patient, AORTC, MSG group, define uh, uh, diagnostic tools uh, for this kind of patients is not easy to have the same kind of uh, 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 methods for ICU patients. But then when we discuss about the patient in the ICU, it's important to differentiate two different types of patients. So the patients that refer to internal medicine or ICU with invasive aspergillosis, this is a classical patient that is transferred to the ICU because before was in the bone marrow transplant. This is a kind of this different point. Then I will focus my attention today more on patients with invasive aspergillosis diagnosed in the ICU, okay, with a community-acquired form or with a nosocomial form or with the, uh, an ICU form. So looking at the data from the literature, this is a very old data by Cornier, but, you know, they look where uh, the case of aspergillosis occurred in the hospital, and they clearly demonstrate that the majority of the cases of, the IC, of aspergillosis are not in hematological department. Look here. We have more of the cases that were reported in the ICU with more around 50% of the cases. And when we look at the data, at the report incidents, this is a nice review made by George Dimopoulos, the report incident of invasive paracelosis in the ICU is quite different depending on the different type of, of publication. But look, we have some data, especially from Belgium, uh, at the early 
2000 with very high incidence of uh, invasive pergolosis, around 5%, around 6% of the cases. But again, different studies show completely different numbers. So there is a big difference between uh, different ICU. And maybe this is related to the different type of uh, patients that you can admit to your, uh, to your ICU. More medical than surgical, probably more, neom more patient with uh, more patient from uh, lung unit. So probably these are the t typical patient with this type of disease. So this is the f one of the first publication public published in 2004 by Merseman, where they uh, uh, they found uh, around seven percent of the cases with uh, invasive pergolosis of colonization. And uh, they demonstrate that 70% of the cases with invasive pergolosis didn't have hematological malignancy. And uh, uh, at the end, 50% of the cases with invasive pergolosis were patients with COPD. So this is uh, the first very important risk factor for ICU. In Genoa, where I worked before moving to Udine, I analyzed the data from two ICU and we analyzed a lot of patients in a period between 2006 and 2008. And at the end, we, def we, we found only four cases of uh, aspergillosis. And we classified the four cases, two cases of colonization, one probable, one possible. And the global incidence in these two ICU that are the classical Italian ICU, mixed surgical and medical, was very low. So 0 0.5 of incidence. Not so low, but lower compared to the data report from Belgium. So recently, more recently, there are some interesting data reports from, Uni from United States, published a couple of years ago, and uh, they analyze ICU patients with diagnosis of invasive pegulosis uh, uh, in patients where they decide to start an antifungal treatment, and they exclude the traditional host patients, hematological patients, HIV, and more minor transplant. And at the end, the number of patients with ICU in, uh, with uh, aspergillosis in the ICU was quite high, 6.4%, very similar to the data report uh, from Belgium. And the comorbidities based on the ECD9, so this was a retrospective analysis, was quite interesting. So the majority of them report the use of steroids, so 76% of them. So around 35% of the patient with COPD and 41 with acute renal failure. So these are probably very important risk factors. But look, uh, another important point, the mortality. So the mortality report for this patient was really, really high, higher than the normal mortality report for this kind of patient. And in the multivariate analysis, they demonstrated in the uh, initial of uh, an adequate antifungal therapy had a significant impact on mortality. This is another in interesting experience from Italy. Just to show you, these are data that uh, were collected by Anna Maria Tortorano, and we participate in this analysis. Corticosteroid treatment given for autoimmune pathologies of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease was the major host factor. So looking at the risk factors for uh, uh, invasive aspergillosis in the ICU, steroids remain a, a really important factor. So again, in this another experience from uh, Orge Garbino from uh, Switzerland, he, when we look at the type of risk factor, look at the prednisone, was present in the majority of the cases, around 57% of them uh, were previously treated with prednisone. So use of steroids is a really, really important risk factor. But then don't forget another important risk factor. And, and you can see here we have the risk factors for invasive pergillosis. We have obviously neutropenia, but there's more for uh, hematological patients, corticosteroid treatment. And then in yellow, we have all the minor risk factors, COPD, but then, you remember, in the majority of the cases, COPD are treated also with corticosteroid treatment, so it's not easy to define if the, uh, the risk factor was related to the COPD disease, for the lung disease, or to the use of the steroids. And then, another really important risk factor is represented by the severe liver disease that represent another important category of patients. So uh, invasive aspergillosis in COPD is really important. So these are just some images, radiological images, about uh, uh, patients with the, uh, invasive aspergillosis. Here are the traditional 
chest X-ray, and these are, you know, lesion with the CT scan, and this is was, uh, uh, these are three different images, and this was a patient admitted in my, uh, in my unit just uh, last year, and you can see these are, uh, this was a patient with COPD and Aspergillus isolate. So uh, uh, the, 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 the problem of uh, COPD and aspergillosis was uh, deeply studied by, by Guinea, and the first paper was published in CMI in 2010, and they analyzed cases of uh, uh, more than seven years, and they report that the episode of inverted aspergillosis increase of the, the period. You can see here the trend in the number of episodes, and you can see also the, the, the COPD uh, patient with aspergillus isolate that increase over the time. So, and this, uh, you can see that around 22% of aspergillus in COPD, so very high number. And Guinea tried to define the close to the diagnosis of, of invasive aspergillosis. Who is the patient? with COPD that can have a diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis. So gold stage three and four, patient that present exists wheezing, considered tracheobronchitis, worsening infiltrates is an exacerbation, bilateral infiltrates, cultures of aspergillus, and high corticosteroid exposures recently. So the patients treated for uh, very high dosage of steroids or for a very long period of time are probably typical patients uh, with uh, uh, risk factor for invasive aspergillosis. Do not expect fever because usually patients with uh, uh, invasive aspergillosis, but this is very common also to many other fungal diseases, uh, do not expect fever because fever is present in less than 50% of the cases. So another important risk factor that I uh, mentioned before is uh, liver disease. So this is a, 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 a literature, review, literature review made by Marco Falcone, published in Medical Mycology, and they, he compared two periods, you know, 73.99 to 2020.09, and you look at the number increase, report at least the number report in the literature, and you can see that uh, it's very interesting the, the difference between mortality. So in the, the previous period and in the second period, so look, the mortality in the first period was around 90% and it was reduced in the second period. So uh, it's very important to remember that patients, especially patients with end-stage cirrhosis, are very, uh, are patients at high risk to develop invasive aspergillosis. And another important is factors, and we are going to, to go in a flu season now, and uh, look, this was a report of a uh, couple of years ago in intensive care medicine about the invasive aspergillosis and H1N1. So they report about 40 critically ill patients with the confirmed H1N1, and nine of them, 23, develop invasive aspergillosis. So, and again, this is really important, but remember another important consideration is the corticosteroid used seven days before the ICU admission was more present in patients with invasive aspergillosis. It's not easy to define if the patient developed invasive aspergillosis because of the H1N1 or if the patient developed invasive aspergillosis because of the previous exposure to uh, corticos. In any way, it's important to consider as an important factor. And here you have all the different cases divided by probable and uh, proven. So what about diagnosis? It's easy to do the diagnosis of invasive aspergillosis in the ICU. It's probably not easy. Why? Because the radiological findings that are very important for hematological patients are not important for uh, non-neutropenic patients. So the radiological image are not specific. So the classical allo sign, the high crescent signs are not usually present in non-neutropenic patients. I show you two papers that uh, demonstrate that. This is a nice paper published in Journal of Infection where they uh, uh, compare CT images of patients neutropenic and non-neutropenic. And you can see that the allo sign that is very frequent in neutropenic patients is not so frequent in this uh, cohort of patient trans plant passion. And the second uh, study was uh, published last year by Fabio Taccone, and again, they show us that th there are not specific chest X-ray in passion with uh, uh, invasive aspergillosis. So it's important to perform radiological images 
but don't expect to have typical images as we have in hematological patients. So what about uh, tests, microbiological tests? So we use the galactomana. What is the galactomana? Galactomana is an ELISA detection, and uh, we can do the galactomana in serum, BAL, and even in a CSF. Don't forget that this is not the perfect test. So it's a useful, but not the perfect test, because there are a lot of false positive that is uh, quite variable, depending on patient populations and depending on the underlying diseases and depending also on the type of uh, the drugs that we're using. For instance, pipreso or amoxicillin clavulanic acid can increase the level of galactomana. However, we know that uh, if we decide to do the galactomana in this patient, please don't do in the blood because it's not useful, you have to do the galactoman and the BAL. This is a study by Merciman that where they demonstrate that the level of, ga of, uh, of uh, uh, galactoman are very important in the BAL, not in the serum. And in fact, uh, the last uh, European uh, Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Uses guidelines recommend to, uh, not to do in ICU patients the blood determination of the galactomana because there is a better performance in neutropenic patients compared to non-neutropenic, but to perform the uh, galactomana in the BAL. And the optimal cutoff is between 0 0.5 and 1, and the z less than 0 0.5 rule out the invasive aspergillosis. What about the future? So this is a very uh, interesting option for the patient. This was recently published in Critical Care. And this is the uh, lateral flow device test, very useful. You can put inside the BAL and you can have an answer in half an hour. So this was studied by the group of Austrian colleagues and was published last year. And you can see that the sensitivity compared to the conventional BAA culture is interesting. Sensitivity 80%, 81 of specificity, and the important the negative predictive value of 96%. So I believe that probably this can be a test that is useful, easy to use, uh, is a kind of POC, and you can use directly in your ICU. So what about the definition regarding the disease? I told you at the beginning that uh, it's not easy because we don't have definition, but now we have because we present with a, a group of colleagues in Lisbon and it will be published soon in, uh, in, in clinical infectious disease. And these are the definition for uh, infectious pregulosis in uh, ICU patients. Host factor, at least one of the following, neutrophil abnormality, Chronic AWAR abnormalities, decompensate cirrhosis, treating with recognized T cell immunosuppressant or allogenic stem cell transplant, plus clinical presentation. And look, we didn't uh, talk about abnorm uh, typical sign, uh, typical radiological sign, just clinical or radiological abnormalities consistent with the pulmonary infectious disease process that are otherwise unexplained plus mycological evidence, cytological evidence, or galactoman and antigen index, more or equal at 0 0.5 in plasma and serum, or more than one in bronchoalveolar lavage. This is our definition, and this was already discussed, and it's probably easy to have a diagnosis in uh, ICU. So what about the treatment? And this is the last part. So we know that if we don't treat the patient with invasive pergillosis, this is the mortality, quite close to 100% of mortality. So what do we know about uh, antifungal therapy? So we know that uh, the number of antifungal drugs increased over the last 50 years, and now we have more than 30 available drugs for the treatment of uh, fungal diseases. And we have a lot of drugs active against uh, uh, aspergillus. But looking at the data, the only drug that has been studied specifically in uh, uh, non-autopenic patients or specifically in a chronic form of aspergillosis was the voriconazole in the Vertigo trial where they compare, uh, they, they, they analyze the drug and these are the data, very interesting one, very high clinical response at month uh, six. And for this reason, in uh, this recent uh, publication with Massimo Antonelli and uh, many other Italian colleagues, uh, how to manage aspergillosis in non in intensive care unit patients, we recommend to use voriconazole as a first choice for the treatment of uh, invasive aspergillosis in ICU patients with alternative liposomal amphotericin B or echinocandins. The salvage therapy can be combination of voriconazole plus 
amphotericin B or plus echinocannins. The last point is regarding the duration. For how long we have to treat um, our patient with invasive pegylosis? So the, the ICU, the, the Ashman guidelines said that um, if you have a subacute or a chronic, six months is the minimum duration in order to achieve the cure. My opinion is that the optimal duration of invasive pegylosis is basically unknown. And uh, probably there are some patients in which we have to do indefinitive immuno, uh, indefinitive suppressive therapy may be appropriate. There are other patients in which we can stop after three months. So depending on the patient that you have. So in conclusions, so invasive fat pergulosis in non-autopenic patients is an emerging problem. There is a big variable incidence, 0 0.33 to 5.8, other cases 15%. Probably is a problem underestimated. We don't know now. The, the, the problem is really well studied in the majority of the ICU. So don't forget three important risk factors, steroid use, COPD, and liver disease. There are a lot of delayed diagnosis. More galactomannan than CT scan. It's probably more important to do the galactomannan than the CT scan. It's probably the opposite uh, compared to the hematological patient. Bad prognosis, mortality exceeding 70%. Treatment and duration. Voriconazole probably first choice. But don't forget that the duration is really important at least six months. If you want to have the presentation or if you want to be part of this community, please register this website that is www.itai.net. Thank you very much for your attention.